chronic stress is, is a major issue. Um, and stress, stress makes every neurological, I know we said this earlier, but it's worth paying attention. It makes every, everything worse when it's chronic and stress, when you can take advantage of the mechanisms of stress and leverage them, it's tremendously empowering. I mean, I will even say that, I mean, clearly you're not an example of this, but there are a lot of physicians who are very unhealthy. I mean, I, I, this idea that scientists and, and, and doctors are healthy, I mean, just look at most of them, right? No, they're not taking good care. Um, and so th that is not, I'm not poking at them. What I'm saying is that everybody has to learn how to do this. Um, there's, a, there's a truth, which is that we are generally compensated in life for the degree to which we can lean into hard work and effort. But a lot of people learn how to hit the accelerator. And as you said, they never learn how to decompress. So a big part of my lab's work has been to develop zero cost tools that people can use in real time to adjust their levels of stress and calm down quickly. So we can talk about those tools. And then we've also been developing tools that people can do as short practices separate from uh, real life, <laughs> meaning uh, like a, a five minute a day practice that will, what we call raise their stress threshold so that their trigger point to become stressed is further away. And the, the first practice, which um, is based on work that goes back to the 1930s, actually, it's what's called the physiological sigh. Physiological sighs um, are something that we all actually do about once every five minutes. So in sleep or in wakefulness, every five minutes or so, we take a big, deep breath. And we don't realize it, but we do this. And dogs will do this right before they go down to sleep. Um, humans do this. Why do we do that? Well, there are two main uh, reasons why we breathe. One is to bring oxygen into our system. And then that oxygen, it's a beautiful system. It actually, you know, it fills the lungs. And then as we know, it, it moves from the lungs into the bloodstream and our cells require oxygen. And then exhales, we discard carbon dioxide. And we need car oxygen and carbon dioxide, of course, for our health. Um, every cell relies on this. Uh, you, you wouldn't want to get rid of one or the other entirely. The, the stimulus to breathe, meaning the impulse to breathe, is because if you have a small set of neurons in your brainstem that detect the buildup of carbon dioxide in the bloodstream. So when that level gets too high, you take a big deep breath and then you offload the carbon dioxide. That's actually why you do the physiological size to discard car carbon dioxide. As a consequence, you bring in more oxygen. Now, here's what's interesting. The, the lungs are not just two big bags of air. They have millions, actually hundreds of millions of little avioli, little sacs. And when we underbreathe or when we are stressed and when we overbreathe, so either way, when we're, um, those little sacs actually deflate. And because they have fluid inside them, because of surface tension, they are, they are not um, easily reinflated. And so we're actually asphyxiating ourselves. We don't have oxygen and we're not able to offload carbon dioxide. Bad situation. The physiological side that I recommend that people do when they're feeling stressed anytime or any place, I suppose, unless you're underwater, is to do two inhales through the nose, back to back. The first one is a big, long inhale. And then the second inhale, you're only going to be able to sneak in a tiny bit of air and then a long, complete exhale through the mouth. So it's... So it's a very sharp little second inhale after the first one. You almost feel like you couldn't get any more air in, but when you do that second inhale, you reinflate the alveoli of the lungs. You snap open all of those. They don't break. And then when you exhale, you offload the carbon dioxide. Doing that just once, sometimes two or three times, but just once, we know from data in our laboratory and other laboratories will immediately reduce your levels of stress and anxiety, immediately. It's the fastest approach that I'm aware of to de-stress. Far faster than trying to tell yourself not to worry, certainly far faster than telling you or somebody else to take a deep breath. Yeah. It's this, this double inhale through the nose, exhale through the mouth is a very efficient way to bring in oxygen, dump carbon dioxide, and reinflate the alveoli of the lungs so that in the immediate moments afterward, you're breathing more naturally and more calmly. So it's a, you know, I, I don't like to use the phrase of like power tools and this kind of thing, because that's not the business I come from. But I think if there were one tool um, that I would like everyone to do, it would be the morning light viewing. But the other tool I'd love for people to have in their kit is this physiological sigh. And as I mentioned, you do this spontaneously in low, claustrophobic environments, People do it during sleep when um, they are developing apnea. Um, they'll, and then 
when, when we cry or we observe someone crying, watch how they recover their breathing after sobbing. Because sobbing is mostly exhaling. Yeah. <laughs> and then they, <sighs> there's a, like a kind of a, like a reverber reverberating um, inhale. So big inhale, second inhale through the nose, just squeeze in a little bit more and then long exhale through the mouth. And that one has saved uh, me and I, from the feedback I've gotten, it saved many, many people many, many times. And it, it can be done essentially anywhere. Is, is that in some ways a reset for your nervous system? Things are getting out of control, tension, pressure's building up, and you instantaneously can sort of what, reset it back to baseline. Is that a way that we can think about it? Yeah, think about it as a break on the adrenaline system. Think about it as, um, because when there's elevated carbon dioxide in the bloodstream, the brain registers that and sends a signal to your adrenals, uh-oh, we're running out of air, you need to move, you need to get to someplace else in order to not asphyxiate. And so this is why the, the signal is so powerful. Now, I think that there's, a, there's another aspect to this, which is that when our minds are racing out of control, it's very hard to stabilize our thinking with thinking. I always say, you know, trying to control your thoughts with thoughts is like trying to grab fog. It's very, very difficult. So when your brain and your mind and your thinking aren't where you want them to be, you need to look to your body to, to recalibrate your state of mind so that then you get a new vantage point to view whatever it is that you happen to be contending with mentally. I actually had this happen the other day. I've been dealing with a, with a set of issues that are kind of chronic and ongoing and it's a slow grind and it's, it's working out that details aren't important or relevant here. But um, it's something I have to think about a lot each day, what I'm gonna do, how I'm gonna handle this situation. And I noticed I was on the plane and I was feeling pretty stressed about this. And you do a couple of these physiological sighs and then what happens is you're able to still parse those thoughts, but from a, a different perspective. It's much easier to look to the body, readjust your state of mind to a calmer place and then be able to analyze something um, cognitively than it is to try and prevent yourself from thinking about something, which is very hard. Yeah. And in many cases, we, need, we do need to think about what's stressful. I mean, this is something we don't often acknowledge. People think, okay, we're gonna go meditate or we're gonna take a vacation. We're just gonna step away. We're just gonna take a deep breath. All sounds wonderful, right? But Many times the thing that we're stressing about is, is critical to our well-being. It's important that we be able to think about this stuff. So the, use the body to control the mind and place the mind in a, in a better vantage point. That's yeah. the idea. Yeah, I really, I really like that. I think it's so powerful for people. And I think so many people will hear that, Andrew, and go, yeah, you know, when I feel anxious and I do some yoga or I go for a walk around the block, you know, I just don't feel the same when I come back. You know, you you are literally changing the way you experience life through that action. And I, I wanted to talk to you about something that, again, I've heard you speak about many times, which is the idea that, um, you know, grounded in neuroscience, that it is actions and behavior first, thoughts and feelings second. Yeah, um... I definitely believe that we should put our actions first when it comes to taking control of our mental and physical health and performance. I want to be clear that I don't relegate feelings, emotions, and thinking. Um, I'm, I've been open about this before, but I'll be open about it again. I've, I've through a, a lot of effort of my own and through great expense and challenge, I've, I've, I've been doing analysis for many decades. I uh, got into this because I had, I was a bit of a wayward youth and I was forced to do it at first. So I just want to point out that I, I wholeheartedly believe in the value of therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, exposure therapies, talk therapies. I think we are a social verbal species and there's tremendous value to journaling, tremendous value to thinking and to feeling our feelings. However, feelings are complicated and they can become their own trap. Um, being able to parse a hard, emotional problem or being able to think about life in a way that's um, from a good stance as a kind of a, a, I like to think about the stance of the nervous system more than the state because a stance allows you to move in different directions. Whereas a state implies that there's one ideal state to be in all the time, which of course not. I mean, there's a time to be stressed, angry, sad, in awe, devastated. I mean, that's life. That's actually what makes for a rich life. But the ability to be in a good stance around all that means that when we are in a state of deep sadness or deep confusion or great happiness, that we know that we will eventually transition out of that state and, that, and that's a manageable 
um, idea that we're going to transition in and out of these states. One of the hallmarks of mental illness of different kinds is that people have horrible feelings and they feel like those horrible feelings are going to go on forever. That's one of the things that leads to suicidal depression and um, or chronic anxiety as people are, you know, told we're always told, you know, don't, don't think about the future. Don't think about the past. Just be present. Well, what if your present really is awful? That, that doesn't help much. So the reason that I'm a fan of, of physical tools is the following. Orienting towards action first and physical tools is the following. First of all, there is no fossil record whatsoever of the things that we feel or think. None. Your feelings and your thoughts actually are pretty meaningless in the long run. But what you do and what you say has a profound impact on you and other people. Second, using physical practices allows us to communicate with one another about tools. Thinking is tricky. I don't know what I'm thinking, uh, excuse me, feeling half the time. How do I know what anyone else is feeling? You know, I have a colleague in psychiatry who says this. Most of the time, we don't even know what we feel exactly, much less how someone else feels. And so if we were to enter a dialogue around how we're supposed to feel and control our feelings, well, now we're really moving into the realm of wishy-washy nothingness because I can't tell you what to do or how to think about something. But when we're talking about physical tools and using the body to influence the state of mind or the stance of the mind, then we are, we can talk, we know if we're doing the same thing, two inhales followed by an exhale, panoramic vision, light viewing. These are tools that everybody can access. Yeah. And so it, it creates a whole different conversation. I also believe, and I've had a lot of experience with the fact that there are times when things can feel so overwhelming and we are so back on our heels that we have to get outside of our head. And the best way to do that is to get into physical practices. The, the, the um, imagery I like to use is that any moment we are either flat-footed forward center of mass, which is kind of leaning into life and feeling strong, or we're back on our heels. Many people wake up back on their heels. Many people feel back on their heels a lot of the time. So the question is, how do you go from mentally and physically back on your heels to flat-footed stance and, some t and maintain the ability to go into forward center of mass? How do you do that? Well, you do that by controlling the, this basic system in the body that we call the autonomic nervous system. It's a bit of a misnomer because autonomic means automatic, but you can think of it like a seesaw, that on one end is our ability to get into states of alertness and focus, and at the other end is the ability to relax and get into states of calm or sleep or um, deep rest or focused but relaxed. Maybe the even seesaw would be focused but relaxed. And so much of, become, of being functional is the ability to move from yeah. alert to asleep because sleep is so key for our health, of course, or from sleep to getting up and getting outside and exercising. But a lot of people get trapped at one end of the seesaw or the other, chronically activated or chronically exhausted. And the notion of a seesaw is, um, is important here because it's not so much about your ability to be on either end. It's about the tightness of the hinge of that seesaw. What I'm talking about are tools that allow the seesaw to be calibrated so that it's very easy to go from sleep to alert, from alert yeah. to relax, from relaxed back to work, as opposed to getting locked in one position. That's really the key. And so I, I realize this is all, um, I'm talking all in an analogy now, but I think it, I'm hoping it's worthwhile because we've heard so much about mindfulness, which is a wonderful concept. We hear about mental health, we hear about physical health, but it's never actually been defined what is a mentally healthy person, right? Usually when we're talking about mental health, we're talking about mental illness. So to me, a mentally healthy person and a physically healthy person is somebody that can be in action when they need to be in action, can relax when they need to relax, can focus when they need to focus, and can sleep when they need to sleep. Yeah. That's a pretty darn good life. And you can, go, you can get a lot done and you can have very effective relationship to yourself and others with that kind of ability. And that ability is anchored in the nervous system. If you enjoyed that clip, here's another powerful clip that I think you are really going to enjoy. How we breathe absolutely affects us. It even affects the density of our bones. It affects us down to the subatomic level with electrons. So to think that how we breathe does not matter is not based in any real science.